Hey, Carl here to say that Music to Code By is now an app called Music to Flow By. Now you can listen to the tracks on your phone with offline capability. The first three tracks are free, and the entire catalog is available by subscription with a new track arriving every month. Just go to musictoflowby.com for all the links. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Recording from our respective studios just before we go to NDC. That's coming up here in just a week or so. While you're listening to this show, we'll have, may have just been back from it and we'll have a ton more shows because that's the great thing about going to the event is we get a whole bunch of new shows. Right. Right. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. I have something a little off topic, but interesting nonetheless. You may have seen it in your Facebook feed, but go ahead and roll the crazy music and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> All right, dude, what do you got? Well, this is a very interesting device. It's called Wallabot, Mm -hmm. and it essentially lets you see through walls while you're doing stud finding or plumbing or making sure you're not going to drill into a wire or, you know, you could see leaks. You can find leaky pipes. You don't want to drill into a pipe. Ask me how I know. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It really sucks. Actually, that's uh, happened not to me, but to uh, some workers who were here in the in the building, in the studio building years ago. That uh, guy just comes up and he says, hey, I'm really sorry, but I think I drilled into a couple of pipes. Yep. Oh, no. It's bad. It's bad. You got to run off and turn off the water so it stops spraying inside the wall and then cut open the wall and fix the pipe and it sucks. But this thing is really amazing. You just sort of hold it over the wall and you can see things behind the wall that aren't wall. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm not sure what tech they're using under the hood. I don't either. You know, like it's able to pick up plastic pipes as well as metal pipes, which means they're not just using magnetics. Right. It's got to be something else in there. To, uh, yeah. Is it safe to use on yourself? Can I use it like a little x-ray? Well, what do you want to do? Put it up to your head and show that there's nothing there? Is that what you're going to do? You're going there? Kid swallows a penny, you know, you want to see where it is in the <laughs> digestive tract. Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's probably just a kind of radar, which means it's long wave. It's you do not likely to be too hazardous. Well, it can't be hazardous if they're selling it, right? Okay. <laughs> that's yeah, and and let's be clear. That's never happened. They're pre-ordering right now. Right. That's what they're doing. So Yeah, that's right. This might turn out to be one of those things that we used to highlight in, when they were Kickstarters, but it was all BS. But who knows? It yeah. looks like it's working. No, there's a developer edition for 600 bucks that is, you know, you, you can do work on Windows with it and build your own stuff. So hmm. that's guy that could be fun. Could be fun. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So who's talking to us today, Mr. Campbell? I uh, grabbed a comment off of show 1390, the one we did back in December of 2016, a little over a year ago with Justin James, talking about building mobile apps, in this case using Ionic. I suspect we'll have a slightly different conversation today. And this comment comes from Jacob Holovsky, who says, Hello, thanks for this show. I really enjoyed it. I've been working with Xamarin for over a year and a half, and I love listening to other cross-platform mobile opportunities for development that are there. Especially when I hear Justin and others speaking about how easy it is to debug the app. Yeah. Since you basically just have to refresh your browser. I feel like I'm losing a big part of my time having to load an app onto the device or emulator just to test a tiny UI change. And that's that whole cycle. That is so challenging when you're dealing with native apps, where you write the code on one machine, have to compile and deploy to a different machine, usually a phone, and then look at the results. Also, not encountering destroying an activity on orientation change. Oh my God, who came up with this concept? (laughs) Yeah, right. That's nuts. (laughs) <laughs> but then even when you make the app look like native, I can imagine making use of some native libraries must be impossible or just a pain in the butt. Mm. That's where I really appreciate Xamarin for creating or finding bindings to existing libraries. Yeah. And also lots of third-party support out there for Xamarin is normal now, which is true. I mean, lots of different companies, uh, sponsors of our show, right? build Xamarin libraries now. So that's cool. Yeah. I wish there was some combination of the Xamarin framework with the ease of debugging that the PhoneGap world or Ionic world offers. That would make my life so much better. 
No, there isn't anything. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, J- no, Jacob. Sorry. No, it's not. And it, admittedly, that was a year ago, and yeah, there's still no solution to that. We have done some recent shows with James Montemagno talking about tightening up the cycle for Xamarin, but I think you knew a year ago that this was a hard problem, and it's still a hard problem, and we're still looking at other solutions. Maybe our guests might have something to say about that in a few minutes, possibly. Absolutely. So, Jacob, thank you so much for your comment. A .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. We throw darts at him. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Not funny. Tim Sneath <laughs> leads product management for Flutter and Dart. There in the reference. There you go. Working from Google's office in Seattle. He recently joined Google after 17 years leading client platform and developer teams at Microsoft. You can read more about his journey to Google at goo.gull slash 6WDSGO. Obviously. Rolls off the tongue. In his spare time, he plays the piano, battles with the New York Times crossword, and attempts to persuade his mother that her computer does not indeed bear a grudge against her. Adam Barth is also here with us. He is a co-founder of the Flutter Project at Google. And prior to starting Flutter, he was a top contributor to the open source WebKit and Blink web rendering engines. He co-invented HTTP strict transport security and wrote several internet standards, including RFC 6265, which is HTTP cookies, RFC 6454, the web origin concept, and 6797, HTTP Strict Transport Security at IETF and Content Security Policy 1.0 at W3C. Adam, you are clearly overqualified for this stupid show. What are you doing here? <laughs> oh, wow. My goodness. I am, for one, am happy to report that I actually know what these RFCs are because I studied these in the 90s. This is how our internet protocols came to be. And I think it's really cool that somebody like you is contributed to them yeah it's, it's really fun to work at the itf there are all these people who come from all over the world and they all get together in this like hotel and they like talk technical for just like a week it's awesome that must be great <laughs> and but the the rfc development process is not fast no there, there's a lot of steps it's very very slow <laughs> that is <laughs> okay. very true i was trying to be generous <laughs> it's not fast you know trying to be kind it's not speedy <laughs> <laughs> Tim, how are you doing since we last talked to you? <laughs> I'm great, thank you. It's so nice to chat with you guys again. Yeah, you too. Yeah, a few changes. Yeah, a few changes. What have you done? Yeah, well, in, in particular, do you have an answer for the person who left us that message? <laughs> well, yeah, hopefully. We're chatting about Flutter and Dart this morning, I think. I, as you mentioned, was at Microsoft for a good many years and have just joined Google to help with what I think is a really exciting solution to the mobile framework puzzle, that being how do you develop a great application experience fast that runs on mobile devices with good productivity and tooling. Yeah, so tell us about Flutter. I mean, Dart, we, we kind of know what Dart is. It's a language, right? Yeah. But let's talk about Flutter. Yeah, well, you know, the challenge I think that a lot of people have is how do you build an application that leverages the, the best of both uh, iOS and Android without having to set up two separate teams? How do you create something that enables you to have fast performance, to take advantage of native widgets, to be able to compile and edit and prototype quickly? And uh, Flutter is, is really an attempt by Google to bring some of those different things to bear. So Adam was uh, one of the co-founders of it. I, I heard about Flutter when I was approached through random LinkedIn in mail. So uh, it turns out that uh, Microsoft's platform is good for recruiting people from Microsoft to other other companies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I started to read a little bit about Flutter, started to get involved with what these guys were working on. And I thought, this is, this is really perhaps the most exciting platform I've seen since I worked on Avalon and WPF back in the, the distant day. And so I thought, well, I, this seems like something fun to be part of. Neat. So I've been with Google for eight weeks now, uh, working on Flutter and, and Dart. 
And it's an amazing platform, really excited about it. Um, but Adam should really talk about it. I'm, I'm kind of the ignoramus who's still, you know, a, a new Google employee. And uh, Adam really should sort of talk about the philosophy about it since he is really one of the inventors of it. You know, I think that comment was sort of aiming at sort of the developer cycle, which is something we're really passionate about. So we have this a feature we call Hot Reload that lets you basically edit the code of your app and then just push that code to the device. And right in the middle of whatever the app is doing, it just continues on from that point with the new code that you've written. So like if you're in the m- middle of an animation, the animation will just continue and then the like widgets will just like change to show whatever the new code is doing, hmm. which really tightens up the developer cycle to be you know on the order of a few hundred milliseconds. Now, when you're doing that hot reload, is, is this for an emulator or is this actually to a device? No, it's to the actual physical device. We can do it on emulators too, but okay. it's more fun with the physical device because you can touch it. Yeah, no, I, to- I totally agree. Like that's the most real experience. It's just a question of how long it takes. Like that it's all to me now working with a bunch of mobile developers. It's like the, how long does it take for you to write a piece of code, see it run on a device and then get back in and modify that code that that cycle's got to be seconds. Yeah. So we targeted like sub second. So a second was like our, if we did more than a second. We thought we were doing something wrong. Yeah. Wow. And where we ended up was, you know, 500 ish milliseconds for like a substantial out. Interested in terms of the underlying architecture, because, you know, mobile app can mean a bazillion things these days. You know, Xamarin takes one approach. Uh, PhoneGap, Adobe takes another approach. What are you guys doing here? Are you making native apps? Is it a web wrapper? What's the story? Yeah, so most of the other frameworks sort of fall into two camps. They're either wrappers around a web view. So they're ultimately using the web rendering engine to drive the user experience. Or they're wrappers around the OEM widgets or the widgets that are pre-installed on the phone. Yeah. So Flutter takes a different approach than those two things. So we have our own rendering engine and we implement all the widgets in the framework itself, which means they're all built with the same technology that the end developer is using to build their app. Okay. So it's a native app. Yeah. So that just compiles down to ARM code and, and executes. And like the back end we use is basically the GPU. So for example, we use Vulkan on Android if that's available or, or whatever the, the best technology is for talking to the GPU. Wow. Nice. What else do we need to know about it architecturally that differentiates it from these other approaches? So I used to work on web rendering engines. And one of the things that happens there is you're running your application and then you hit the DOM, which is sort of the interface between you and the browser. And then everything below that is implemented with a totally different technology than you're using. Yeah. So one of the sort of philosophical points of view that Flutter has is that you can always go deeper. And what that means is each thing that you're using is built out of the same technology as the previous layer. So you can sort of dig deep down through the framework and see exactly how everything is built. And it's all extensible and composable. So that means if you don't like how we did tap detection, for example, you can write your own tap detector that works exactly or however you want it to work and slot it right in to your existing widgets. Now, the native language for Flutter is Dart. That's right. But at some point, you're going to get far enough down that stack that you're going to get below Dart. Like at some point, it's all C in the end or worse. That's right. So there are two main pieces that are not in Dart. So Dart interfaces with a 2D graphics API Mm -hmm. that we use the Skia library to implement. So for example, path tessellation and things like that, that's done in just C++ because that's a big pile of code and there's not a lot of value for writing another path tessellator. Like the one in Skia is like really awesome. It's been done. Yeah. Yeah. And the other big piece of C++ functionality is the text rendering. So text rendering has to do international text at really high quality is quite a substantial complicated system. So you have to understand like in Arabic, the text goes from right to left instead of left to right. Mm. And then, so in English, you have different letters and they all go right next to each other. But in Arabic and Sanskrit and some other languages, the letters fuse together to create like a single shape mm-hmm. for the whole word. And, and that stuff's really complicated. So we reuse the C++ libraries. Also a thing you do not want to invent. No, <laughs> for that stuff, we use the libraries that are actually built into Android. Because Android is open source, we were able to, to reuse their code. And so you get, you know, super high quality versions of all that stuff. Right, right. And you're pushing that code over to iOS. I love everything about that. Yeah, it's just code, you know, you just compile it and run it. Yeah, yeah. No, well, that's that's really that's really cool. It's just I thought iOS had everything perfect, that their approach to text was gonna be the ideal one. Am I being sarcastic today? I might be. <laughs> that's a little bit. <laughs> And obviously just iOS and Android, which may represent the bulk of the market, but that's what this is for. Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's right. Yeah. What about tablets? Yeah, so it runs on tablets, fine. Yep. 
we haven't put as much effort into the framework to do a lot of tablet specific widgets yet. Although I think that's something that is an obvious thing for us to do soon. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just a little bit more, but I mean, you know, there's no reason you couldn't be there, but obviously your focus has been the phone. Yeah. Like how do we make it easier to build an app that runs both on iOS and Android? And is this one project compiles to two platforms or is there going to be code specific to iOS and code specific to Android somewhere in the project? Yeah, so generally you take your your UI and you compile it once for iOS and once for Android. Mm-hmm. Inside your code, you can write branches that say like, you know, if iOS, then use a, we call it Cupertino style. So use a visual style that is more like iOS. Mm-hmm. And then if Android, go use a visual style that's more like material design. Right. right. You can also put in platform specific plugins. So that's how you get you get access to all the platform functionality. That was my next question. That's a challenge no matter what you're doing, because at some point you still have to hit that iOS programming model in whatever you're doing. And it's nice to be able to abstract that away. That's one thing I like about Xamarin Forms plugins is they abstract it away. So how deep does that go? How many plugins are there? Yeah, so there's an ecosystem of plugins. If you go to pub.dartline.org, you can see all the plugins that are there. I mean, the ecosystem is not nearly as big as the Xamarin uh, plugin ecosystem yet. The plugins are pretty easy to write. So instead of writing a like Uber plugin that can do all the things that this particular uh, platform feature can do, they tend to write very targeted plugins that say, here's the thing that I'm trying to do. And so I'll write a very simple plugin that does exactly that. Nice. Yeah, no, I found the Flutter packages site at Dartlang. There's a few. It's not thousands, but it's dozens. Well, and there's things that I'm interested in already Mm -hmm. that I see, you know, in the audio side. Yeah, of course you are. Yeah. <laughs> Always worrying <laughs> about audio. Yeah. For better or worse. I'm funny that way. Oh, well, there's a, there's a lot to do here, but it looks like Firebase playing a major role. So that's part of your deployment process? Uh, so you don't have to use Firebase with mm-hmm. Flutter if you don't want to, but obviously we have a good collaboration with the, the Firebase team at Google and there's quite good support for using a lot of Firebase services. Well, I think people are familiar with it too, right? Like that, I think it makes people happy actually to see something like, oh, okay, well, I already know how to do that. Yeah, a lot of our customers choose to use Firebase and have a very good experience with it. Mm. But there are other ways. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not required in, in any sense. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I just don't know if it makes people eat life easier or not. There's, there's many choices here. Hey, guys, hold that thought right there while we just take a minute to hear this very important message. This is Dr. Jason Fung. As you may know, my friend Carl Franklin has reverse type 2 diabetes, lost a lot of body fat, and got off all his medications by adopting a combination of a low-carbohydrate diet and intermittent fasting. In my clinical experience, I see this reversal happen in multiple patients every single day. Well, Carl is now hosting and producing my new project, the Obesity Code Podcast, where patients share their success stories and experts chime in to explain the science. Type 2 diabetes is preventable and reversible, and you can do it for free. Check us out at obesitycodepodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. All right, and we're back. It's .NET Rocks, Carl Franklin, Richard Campbell, Tim Sneath is here, Adam Barth is here. We're talking Flutter and Dart. Flutter, a uh, interestingly cool new platform, I guess you'd call it, for writing, uh, developing mobile apps for iOS and Android with a single code base. And we got all sorts of stuff going on here. We got the Dart language, we got plugins, we've got a native experience, and what they're promising is a extremely fast development experience. Maybe we should talk a little more about that. What is this dev environment? What am I installing? What coding? I presume not Visual Studio. <laughs> That's going to be a pretty safe bet. Just guessing. So I use Visual Studio Code, actually. So mm-hmm. there's a really good Dart Flutter plugin for that, that that I like. The officially supported tool chain is based on IntelliJ. Right. So there's we have a plugin for IntelliJ. And that's really quite full featured. I just happen to like Visual Studio Code because it's like pretty. <laughs> yeah. It is nice. Well, and you're not alone. Lots of folks are really enjoying it. It's interesting to see where, where VS Code shows up. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't aware that you could write Dart code in VS Code. Yeah, so the plugin is actually done by one of our community members, and he's done a really fantastic job. That's neat. Excellent. How do we describe Dart to folks who've not programmed in Dart? What's it, what is its sort of nature? Yeah, so I think of Dart as... Uh, if you've ever written any C Sharp or Java or JavaScript, any of this sort of Algol family of languages, like Dart to you will look like just sort of the most normal thing you've ever seen. Hmm. So yeah. there's like curly braces and semicolons. And as part of working on Flutter, we did a bunch of user studies with developers. We brought them in, had them try using the framework to try to build a particular screen of an app. And we brought them in and we didn't even really tell them what programming language they were working in. We just sort of dropped them into the template project you get 
when you create a new Flutter app and said, here, try this out. And they had no trouble. They just built the screen. And at the end of the study, you asked them, so what programming language do you think you're using? And they said, I don't know. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. It's not that different from C Sharp. It's really not that odd at all. The syntax reads very similarly. There's a few different symbols, but it's not, it's not crazy. So statically typed? Yeah, so what's fascinating is the underlying execution model of the language is completely dynamically typed. Okay. But the compiler will statically check everything for you. Oh, okay. Kind of like C Sharp. Yeah. And it's that sort of dichotomy that really allows the hot reload to shine. Because when you have a statically compiled language and the execution model at runtime is also built on that, you can't really change anything because it's static. Right. And so if you try to replace a piece of the code, it won't fit in the spot. But because the execution model is dynamic, then you can just replace pieces of the code and it'll just dynamically keep executing and go on from there. I know you talked about this early on, but the, the hot reload thing, can you just bring us back to that? I mean, before I, I didn't quite have the big picture, but now it's all coming to me. Tell us about that experience again. Yeah, so it feels sort of like if you ever used the web inspector in Chrome and like edited your CSS live on your website, it sort of feels like that, but you're actually just writing real code in your like IDE and the app is updating in real time to reflect it. And the, the reason this works so well is because the app keeps its state. So everything on screen, all the timers that are running, yeah. all the like whatever screen you've navigated your app to, it'll all stay there and just the code will change and have the new behavior that you've typed in. Right. That's cool. So it's a bit different. So in, in Ionic, for example, when you do their fast reload, I'm not sure what, how they brand it, but that basically does a reload of the web view, which takes you back to the initial state of wherever you are. And so you lose the context of, you have some menu open or something you're working on, the menu will close because it's not in the initial state. Right. Whereas here, if you have a menu that you're tweaking the margins or fonts or whatever you're doing, that will stay open during the, the reload. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. And it's that's smart. You just carry the state forward so you can get right back to where you are. I don't want to even think about the voodoo you've got to do under the hood to make that true. Well, what's fascinating is, so the, the framework is based on the reactive paradigm. So it's similar to the way React.js is structured, mm -hmm. where as a widget, you just describe what you want your view state to be. And it's the framework's job to figure out how to take the current state and make it update it to match your target state. And the fact that the framework is structured that way really makes the hot reload work because when you change all the code and you totally change the format of all your widgets and all your views and everything, normally if you're not using this paradigm, there's no code anywhere that knows how to edit the current state and bring you to that state. Mm. But because that's not the developer's responsibility, that's the framework's responsibility, there's a very general algorithm for that. And so we can take you from whatever state you were at with your old code base to whatever target state you've described with your new code base, just sort of directly. Interesting. And then you mentioned React.js, and I'd always thought of Dart as like a coffee script or something like that, as something that compiles down to JavaScript. It was just another way to write sort of reliable JavaScript. It seems to have morphed. So another great thing about uh, working with the Dart team is they're here at Google and they work quite closely with them. And so when we started working on Flutter, that was sort of their main tool chain was a compiled to JavaScript tool chain. Mm. Still exists and it's still like very widely used inside Google. Mm -hmm. But we got them to add the native tool chain. So basically take the same source language, all the same code that was being compiled to JavaScript and compile it down to ARM code and execute it. Neat. So yeah, having the team there and they literally just built you a different kind of compiler. Yeah, they've built actually like three compilers for us. Wow. Because on iOS, you're not allowed to have dynamic code. Right. So they built a, also a bytecode interpreter for us. And so that's how on iOS devices you get the hot reload experience is during development, not during production, but just during development, mm -hmm. it's doing a bytecode interpreting. And then for production, you compile down to ARM code. And you can no longer hot reload that because it's obviously statically compiled. Sure. And it's worth mentioning that the JavaScript stuff still very much exists. We also have a couple of different JavaScript transpilers, one for development use that produces pretty human readable JavaScript and another for very much production orientated JavaScript for, for running in, in highly scalable environments. So Dart is, is not just a, a Flutter thing, although it's being used heavily by, by Flutter, we're seeing it used by several of the largest Google products as a language for Angular-based web environments. So, uh, for example, AdWords, uh, which is, of course, one of the biggest businesses for Google, they wrote application uh, using uh, Dart, and it powers all of the AdWords infrastructure behind the scenes. 
And the Angular team uses TypeScript. And I'm, back in the day, and again, this is old thinking, I, clearly for me, I got to look at this again. I looked at Dart and TypeScript as kind of competitors. Here was two ways to raise a higher level language that would ultimately go down to JavaScript and hope and, you know, try to make JavaScript code more maintainable. But Dart's clearly morphed. Interacting with an Angular app that, again, in the end, it's all JavaScript anyway, even if it did start out as TypeScript. Yeah, I mean, our vision for, for Dart really is to be a front-end optimized language, to be something that is designed for building great experiences, regardless of whether the mobile or web is your uh, target platform. So we'll continue to add features on both sides there. Yeah, I'd always been keen to this idea that someday there would be a Dart-speaking browser. So rather <laughs> than having to go down to this sort of assembly code that is JavaScript, you would have a higher level executing browser in the first place. It just seems like it went a different way. Mm. Yeah, it went a different way. So I think what happened was mobile rose in importance. Right. And so getting a high quality developer experience on mobile became a you know priority for the whole company. And so that's where the investment went. Yeah, I, th- I think that's very fair too. There's still a discussion and, and Google's in the midst of this as well. When you think about the progressive web app as a way to build high quality apps into phones via their browsers. And I think Google's leading the way as far as PWAs are concerned as opposed to the native approach. Is that actually better or worse? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm enjoying watching it happen. Yeah, I mean, the PWAs are pretty awesome. I haven't tried actually building one myself. I've been more focused on on getting Flutter working and mm-hmm. making it work really well. Although, I mean, I'm reading through the documentation here, and you kind of take a page from CSS in terms of styling. So when you go to a new framework, there's a learning curve. Yeah. And so we wanted to think about how could we make that learning curve as easy as possible. And so we picked up uh, a lot of CSS names and concepts. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not exactly CSS, but if you're familiar with CSS, this stuff will look familiar to you. And you can probably guess how you create a border and how you, like this thing called margin and padding. And it's sort of roughly analogous and helps you get a foothold to start exploring the framework. Yeah, why reinvent terms there? Font size, font weight, like we get it. Yeah, I spent many years working on web rendering engines. And so I mm. all those terms were quite familiar to me. And so yeah. it was very straightforward to sort of apply the same terminology. Awesome. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Uh, It must be that happy time again. Yeah, it's time to watch all my great lofty ideas for a mid-show joke just flitter, flutter away. (laughs) There they go. (laughs) Bye-bye. That's nice. We got a dart reference at the top, and we got a flutter reference in the mid. And neither were funny, actually. Oh, well, you know. (laughs) That's how it goes when you're me. (laughs) It's actually time to give away a D experience subscription from DevExpress to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. And check out their DevExtreme React grid built from the ground up to fully support all the cool features that come with React, like the virtual DOM and state controllers like Redux. It supports master detail, sorting, grouping, paging, and editing. And you can check it out and test it for free on GitHub. But learn more and download your free 30-day trial of DevExpress Universal at devexpress.com slash superhero. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Brian J. Talbot. Where's this is Brian. Yeah. Golf clap for you, sir. And uh, Brian just won the D-Experience subscription, a big pile of awesome from our friends over there at DevExpress, just for being a member of our fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .netrocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join up. It's very easy. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the said fan club. But you have to sign up to win. And of course, we like to ask our guests, Tim and Adam, if you had $5,000 to spend today on technology, what would you buy? Start with you, Mr. Sneath. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, last time you asked me, uh, I was talking about Sonos devices, um, but I've bought a few of those now, so I'm going to switch my answer. I've uh, had this retro computing kit for a while, and mm. since I left Microsoft, I switched my retro computing collection away a little bit from from Windows. I used to have a, a virtual m- machine museum of every Windows release since one one oh. Wow! But now I'm starting to look at the hardware side a little bit, and I've been wasting a lot of time these last couple of weeks browsing around eBay for 
classic Macintoshes, ZX Spectrums, computers of the 80s and 90s that uh, need a bit of refurbishment, but can be brought back to uh, as good as new condition. And that seems like a fun kind of project to be spending a bit more time on. So I'm starting to build up a collection of random bits of old <laughs> computers that need uh, a bit of servicing and bringing back to life. Wow, cool. Are you actually doing board repairs on any of that stuff, Tim? I say this because I have a buddy who's been keeping a Tira Sadie Model 3 alive for the past 25 years, 30 years. Uh-huh. And he's at a point now where traces have come off the board. Like oh, these. Gosh. And so we're, you're literally point rewiring the, the board itself to keep it up functioning. Yeah, no, I, I'm not a hardware guy. So uh, the best I could I could do is a bit of swapping one part out from another. But some of these uh, machines from the 80s and 90s, it's it's things like, you know, the batteries, you know, the daytime batteries have, have gone and yeah. they need replacing. The hard drives are clearly, you know, at the end of their natural life. Floppy disks need lubricating. And, you know, it's just a lot of bits of uh, work. And of course, all the beige computer cases that were really the thing in, in the 90s, they're all yellowing and the mm. people are using things like uh, um, hair bleach to kind of Restore them back to the the natural, beautiful beige color they started. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some thirty five years ago, for me, my winter time job was aligning five and a quarter inch disk drives, and I was fast at it. They paid me twenty <laughs> bucks a drive to do alignment. So there you go. Well, maybe I'll tap into your skills yet. Yeah, I <laughs> couldn't tell you. I have no idea how to align a drive anymore. Like that, that's a long time ago. <laughs> It involved an oscilloscope. <laughs> Adam, how about you? What would you buy with five grand? Well, I've been really getting into digital painting, and I've been doing it mostly on my iPad. Oh. But all like the professional painters, they all have these Cintiqs, these like yeah. giant stylus monitors are yeah. super expensive. I know, I just look at it in the catalog and I'm like, oh man. But yeah, probably something like that. Yeah, the 22 inch, great way to burn through 5,000 bucks in a big old hurry. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, you know, look, they got the new 27. I had to take a peek. Uh, how much? Sell to me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think of the Surface Studio? Do you think uh, that's a viable alternative? I love that. I wish I had one. And uh, ultimately, I opted for something with a little more power. But I love the the screen. I mean, that's that's the killer for it. I'll tell you, my daughter, who who makes a living as an artist, has both a Cintiq and a Surface Pro 4. Uh-huh. And she uses the Pro, which actually uses Wacom technology in its screen, the, the pen tech. It's actually Wacom's tech. And she uses the Pro 4 more because it's portable. Mm. The 27-inch Cintiq is not small. You don't carry it around. It's it, it's sort of fixed in place. And <laughs> and so she carries that, that Pro 4. And it's got more pen time than the Cintiq does. Tough to use the digitizer on the New York Metro or something like that. Yeah, mm. it's just not that easy to do. But uh, <laughs> she feels they're comparable. And I think it's because underlyingly it's the same tech. Oddly enough, having a father who's a little technical has meant she's had pretty much every Wacom product you could think of over the years. So it took her a long time to draw on the screen because she learned to draw on a Wacom tablet, which would back then was just a pad. Yeah. So yeah. that your your pen and stuff was down there and you looked up at the screen. And so when the first time we went to something like a Cintiq, she's like, huh, this whole I have my hand on the screen thing bugs me. Yeah. Mm. But the new 27 inch, 2,500 bucks. So Mm. you can buy two of them. (laughs) Dual monitor Cintiqs. (laughs) That's it. You're right. A left hand and a right hand. That's not excessive. That, that's not excessive at all. Why not both? You know, they, I would argue <laughs> the most important feature on these things is the angle that they put themselves at, that you can get them down to that low angle. What everybody loves about that Surface Studio is not the computer. The computer is fine. It's nothing special. It's good. The fact that it has a spinning hard drive in it is a sin, but it's that monitor. Give me the monitor with its ability to pivot down yeah. to that drafting table angle. I want that. Yep. Magic stuff. Magic stuff. I love it, love it, love it. Okay. Can we talk a little bit more about the developer experience and the cycle of build, debug, test? Sure. Do a little bragging for us. I mean, the thing that I really like about it, which I don't know whether other people care about this, is when I'm working on the framework itself, I get to use the same tools Mm -hmm. that the end developers use. And what that means is whenever we hit some crazy corner case of the like, hot reload system where it doesn't quite work perfectly. Mm-hmm. Like I hit that in my like day-to-day work. And so then I go over and I talk to the people who work on the VM and I'm like, look, this thing isn't quite perfect. And they're like, okay, okay. And so what that means is if you repeat that process many, many times, you get a, a workflow that actually works and actually 
handles all the corner cases. A lot of the other hot reload things in other frameworks, they're sort of like a marketing feature that people who work on the frameworks don't actually use on a day-to-day basis. Mm, and so, right. yeah, they, they, they work well on stage and you can demo them. But when you actually get into actually doing your, your day-to-day work and doing all the things you actually need to do, you know, that you run into limitations. Yeah. But is it actually faster? Like, is it prone to crashing your machine? Does it give you an authentic experience so you fix something that doesn't need fixing? Like, those are the sins. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so like another feature of, of Dart that's helpful is in Dart, every type is nullable, which means null is always a valid value for things. Ah, mm-hmm. okay. So, nulls that aren't actually null. Yeah. So, like an int could be null, for example. Right. And that's helpful how? It's helpful because... Suppose you edit your code to change the shape of an object. Say you add a bunch of fields to an object. Then in another system, if you tried to hot reload that in and reshape all the existing objects in memory, you would run into trouble because they would be in some invalid configuration. But in Dart, you can always fill in those values as null and those are valid values to have. But it also means you have to do a lot of null checking, doesn't it? Yeah. And so there are all these language features in Dart to help you with that. So the, they're the null aware operators, mm-hmm. which where you, you, they tend to use like question marks. I think some people call them the Elvis operators because the <laughs> question mark kind of looks like Elvis's hair. Hmm. And so you tend to use the Elvis operators a lot. I like that term. Elvis operators. Yeah, that's cool. I'm writing that down. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I only dressed as Elvis once. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it took me forever the first time I heard that. They're like, oh, you should use the Elvis operator. And I'm like, what is the Elvis operator? <laughs> and then they showed me and I was like, okay. And then I like one day I saw it and I was like, oh, it's uh, his hair. I get it. The hair. <laughs> Do you guys have any kind of um, get up to speed guidance for developers on other languages who are just completely new to Dart? Yeah, so the best way of uh, getting on board with this, if you just Google for Flutter Code Lab, code lab one word or two unless you're in bing in which case it probably only works one way you can uh, there's a, a an hour tutorial that just kind of walks through building a, a flutter app using dart it's really a good way to get to grips with the platform some of the stuff that adam's talked about the hot reload the uh, tooling and it's a really neat way to to learn the language just as an inherent sort of artifact of learning the, the framework and the tools so that's my kind of top tip i guess in terms of learning the language there's also a great, couple of great talks on youtube eric seidel who's one of the other leads for for flutter engineering he's got a really good video that he recorded just about a month ago which which walks through all this stuff with some some live demos that are obviously tough to do in a podcast. Nice. Anything else you'd add, Adam? Yeah, so if you go to flutter.io, you can also find links to all these things. Yeah, absolutely. The language syntax looks C, C sharp-ish, you know, curly braces, semicolons. It's not yeah. It's not that weird. You're just going to have to learn the little differences. Right. I'm still thinking through the whole tool suite because Visual Studio Code, I think most people will grab onto that. It's lovely. You need the Dart plug in. Mm-hmm. Are there other bits I need to download? Yeah, so the way it works is you clone our GitHub repository, and then that comes with all the stuff you need. Mm -hmm. So in there, there's a command line tool that's also confusingly called Flutter that then can create you a starter project, can like drive all your connected mobile devices, help you publish your app, take screenshots, do it's sort of like a Swiss Army knife kind of tool. Right. And then the the IDE basically finds that tool and then just drives it for you from the graphical interface. Nice. Nice. You can run this thing called Flutter Doctor, which basically just sort of tests everything on your machine as well. That's kind of neat. So if it if it notices that you need something, you know, an extra package on your Mac or you need uh, something on the Android side, it's it's very good at telling you what you need. All right, let's talk about brick walls. Is there anything you can't do with this? Is there anything that you guys know about that you would like it to be better at? Probably the, the most requested feature that we haven't done yet is integrating with the Maps uh, widget that comes with the, the different phones. Oh, yeah. Hmm. That's a plugin problem, though, right? That's right. So we have the plugins that don't have any visual component work really well. And the part that we're currently working on improving is the part where plugins have a visual component. Right. So for example, we have a video plugin that works well now, and we're working on a Maps plugin and things of that nature. So when I go to the the Dartlang Flutter packages and search for Maps, I get a map view, which was updated December 30th. And a Google Maps web service is updated like December 21st. So these are super current, like they've been worked on. All they're all incremental updates because we're living in alpha land. Isn't this what I need to make maps work? Yeah. So those things will help you. And a lot of people's needs for maps can be addressed by that. Mm -hmm. There are some people who have uh, more advanced needs that will need a more advanced maps plugin. Right. Okay. So so this is degrees of sophistication that you are getting enough cases that it's bubbling to the top of, I need to do more with maps. That's right. 
Yeah, and to be clear, you know, we're at an alpha stage right now with the products. We're still getting ready for release. So, so, so there's a bunch of these kinds of things that we know we need to uh, fill out before we get to release. Maps is a good example of that. And so there's a bunch of those items we'll work on. We need to improve our uh, onboarding experience. Like any, you know, any product manager, any engineer will give a litany of things that they wish were, will be done. But, uh, but, but in general, the, the fundamental architecture is pretty suitable for, for a broad base of client app development. So what would you like our listeners to do? I'd love them to go to Flutter.io and download it and give it a try and see what you think. And can you spell that URL for us? Yeah, Flutter, uh, F-L-U-T-T-E-R dot I-O. Easy, Flutter.io. When do you come out of alpha, Tim? <laughs> we haven't announced a date yet. We're getting there. We're already in a place where I think a lot of people would say, well, or I've had the, the specifically have said, people have said to me, well, why, why are you an alpha? Cause you look like you're, you're done. And I think that there are elements of the product itself. The core architecture is in a pretty stable state. We do want to add some of these packages. We want to fill out the ecosystem a little bit. I think the thing I want to get across is that we are already seeing apps that are using Flutter in pretty heavy duty ways. One of the most well known examples is the Hamilton app, you know, Hamilton, the, Broadway show. Oh, yeah, sure. They built an app a few months back and they picked Flutter because they needed to move really fast. They needed to support both iOS and Android. And they built a really beautiful app, a design agency in New York called Posse, um, working with the Hamilton show team have built this beautiful app that, that really demonstrates, I think, pretty well the kind of highly expressive, custom-branded experience that Flutter's sweet spot is. And so, yeah, that'll be another, I guess, a call to action. So Flutter.io for the website, play with the, the Flutter Code Lab, uh, and then uh, download the Hamilton app and uh, have a look at that as an example of what Flutter can do. Neat. It sounds good. Well, Tim, Adam, thank you very much. It's been amazing having you guys on. Oh, thanks for having us. Absolutely. And good luck with this project and come back and tell us when the next version comes out. Thank you. It's been blast. All right. Always good to chat with you guys. You too, Tim. All right. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC.